In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to our study and reflection on the 30th Sunday of Ordinary Time, Year B. We're looking at the Gospel, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. This Gospel is a beautiful Gospel because it's filled with a lot of spiritual symbolism, and we're going to talk about that today. So, the gospel, if you want to look at the context, always ask yourself, what's the context of a particular gospel reading? And that will really help you to understand that gospel. So the context to this reading that we have today in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52, it really picks up in Mark chapter 8. And in Mark chapter 8, Jesus begins to speak about his cross. It all begins after Peter points out that Jesus is the Messiah. Go to Mark chapter 8, verses, uh, verse 34 and onward, and then Jesus begins to talk about his passion in chapter 8, the very first time. They're all the way in the north of Israel, and after that, they journey down into the area of Galilee, and he speaks about his passion a second time in Mark chapter 9. And then they're journeying towards Jerusalem, and Jesus is leading the way to Jerusalem. If you go to Mark chapter 10, right around verse 30 to 34, you can see that Jesus is leading the way to Jerusalem. And his disciples are actually in fear. They're marveling that he's leading the way, but they're also in fear. And that's when he speaks about his passion, his suffering, his death, his resurrection a third time. It's the third prophecy about his passion. And this is all forming the context. And his own disciples fail to understand the cross. They fail to understand that he has come to give his life for our salvation. How many times have we failed to understand the cross in our own life? And so in the context of all of these events, in the context of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, wanting to be at the right and the left of our Lord Jesus and failing to understand the cross, we have today's gospel. So let's talk about blind Bartimaeus and all the spiritual symbolism in this reading. So it says that they came to Jericho. So they're getting really close to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, it, it, before you go up to Jerusalem, if you're coming from the east, and that's where they're coming from, they're coming from the side where the Dead Sea is. And so they're passing through Jericho as they're going up to Jerusalem. Many people, when they go to visit Jerusalem, they actually go the opposite journey. They go from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Um, and so just imagine Jesus coming up, you know, he's going through Jericho, and now they're going to ascend up to Jerusalem from Jericho. Jericho is about 800 feet below sea level. Imagine that. And they're going to go up to Jerusalem, which is over 2,400 feet above sea level. And so it says, as he was leaving Jericho. Jericho is very symbolic because when you read the book of Joshua, the great battle of Jericho is one of the symbolic battles that underlines how the Lord will conquer, you could essentially say, the gods of the Canaanites, okay? It, it's the city of the moon god, Jericho. And so the great battle of Jericho, it's a battle of faith. When Israel, uh, when they circle the city for seven days and then they circle it seven times on the seventh day, you can find all that in, uh, in the book of Joshua, chapter 6. And, and if you go to the playlist on my channel, I have videos on the book of Joshua which cover that. But they're going up from Jericho. They're leaving Jericho, heading to Jerusalem. Uh, with his disciples and a great multitude. So you can just imagine the scene. The 12 disciples of Jesus, also known as apostles, other committed disciples of Jesus, and a great multitude of people. And they're all going to Jerusalem, and they don't understand the cross. And so immediately they, they encounter this man, and his name is Bartimaeus. Now, in 
Aramaic, which is the lingua franca of the time, Bar could mean son, okay? So this man's name is son of Timaeus, okay? And so it's kind of interesting that he's called Bar Timaeus and then also called son of Timaeus because essentially you're saying the same thing twice. Bar Timaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, okay? We got that. So Bar can mean like son and then Timaeus or Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. So he's called a blind beggar. And this is really interesting because I put it in red in the reading. You can see how again and again, he's called blind man, blind man, blind man. Uh, and this is not an accident because in the book of Isaiah, there's a very profound sense of Israel being spiritually blind. And we're gonna look at my notes in a moment and talk about this. So just hold that thought. Here's a man who's physically blind, but he's not spiritually blind. So the themes of physical blindness and spiritual blindness are really at the heart of this reading here as Jesus is going to the cross. And this is really important because as I mentioned before, there are many times in our own lives where we fail to understand the cross of Christ. We want a Messiah without a cross. This is our society today. Back in the 90s, especially the 80s and 90s, there was a huge movement in the United States, and many people referred to it as the prosperity gospel, health and wealth. You believe in Jesus, and he he gives you health and he gives you wealth. And th this was very popular for maybe a generation or, or so. But then after a while, people started to say the whole thing about the prosperity gospel is that essentially it denies the cross of Christ. It denies the aspects of the crucified Messiah that are part of the faith. And namely, that the love that we have in the new and eternal covenant, it's a sacrificial love. A Messiah who is manifesting a sacrificial love and a Messiah who is calling us as disciples to live out a sacrificial love of commitment. So we live in a society of fast food where our pleasures are satisfied right away. And the faith that we live is different. It calls for perseverance. It calls for us to hang in there during trials and difficulties and be committed even when, you know, it's maybe not what I'm feeling. It, it, uh, a gospel that tells us not to follow our feelings, but to follow Jesus. You often hear people say, follow your heart. And our response to them would be, I don't want to follow my heart. The human heart is deceptive, says Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 17. I don't want to follow my heart. I don't want to follow my feelings. I want to follow Jesus. I want to pick up my cross and follow him. I want to live the sacrificial love of the new and eternal covenant because through that sacrificial love, true love is manifested. And that's what every marriage will tell you if they've been through a lot of trials and tribulations. They'll say that through all their sacrifices, their trials, their tribulations, they discovered what their marriage was really all about. So my brothers and sisters, blind Bartimaeus, this encounter with Jesus can teach us a lot. So it says that the multitude is following Jesus. His disciples are following him, which would include the apostles and other disciples. And they encounter Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, sitting by the roadside. So the image of sitting by the roadside is very important for Mark because Mark is taking us on a journey to the foot of the cross. Okay, and so here's a man who's sitting by the roadside as Jesus is taking the multitude to the foot of the cross. And the question is, are you going to follow Jesus too? Are you going to follow him to the foot of the cross? And so it says, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he's heard about Jesus. He's probably heard about all the miracles that Jesus has done all the healing that he has done. And he began to cry out and say, son of David, have mercy on me. And now what Bartimaeus says is really incredible because very few people recognize Jesus as the son of David. 
it's a backwards way of saying you're potentially the king of Israel. You're a candidate for the throne because the king of Israel could only be a Davidic descendant. God made a great promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. He promised David that you will always have a descendant upon your throne and your throne will be eternal. And so how will this promise be completed? We know the answer. Jesus Christ, a descendant of David, will reign for all of eternity over a kingdom that is ever expanding and has no end. So here's Bartimaeus. He's putting it all together, son of David. And his second petition is even more startling. He doesn't say, heal me. He doesn't say, take away my blindness. The first thing he is asking for is, have mercy on me. And this is really why this reading is so theologically filled with symbolism. Bartimaeus recognizes something about Jesus' Jesus's identity. He's potentially the king of Israel. He's the son of David. He's the one that we're waiting for. And he also recognizes what he needs as a disciple. The thing that we need before we need anything else we need mercy. We need forgiveness. This is the very reason why when we come to celebrate Mass, we begin by turning to the Lord and asking for forgiveness of our sins. And a lot of times, you know, people will, will feel uncomfortable at that moment. You know, why do we need to start every Mass and ask for forgiveness of our sins? Because when we open our eyes spiritually and when we recognize what do we need most we will recognize Jesus, the King of Israel, the promised Messiah. He has come to give us forgiveness. And so the request of Bartimaeus is extremely important. Here's a man who needs healing. He wants to see, but he recognizes there's something I need even more than curing my blindness. I need mercy. And so I like to say that he's blind, but he can see spiritually. He recognizes what he needs. And this is what helps us in our own spiritual blindness, in our own walk with Christ. The more we're able to recognize that we need his mercy and we turn to him, the King of Kings, asking him for mercy and forgiveness, then our spiritual blindness will be taken away then we will begin to see more clearly what God wants for us in our life. A lot of times people will say, you know, I'm not sure what God wants for me. And I'll say to them, you know, the first step is turn to him, give your whole life to him, recognize who he is and ask him for mercy. And so, so the words of Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. These words should pierce our hearts. These words should tell us something about our own life. And so in verse 40, 48, it says, many rebuked him. Can you just imagine the multitude saying, shut up, be quiet, calm down, leave him alone. They were telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more. And I love the image of Bartimaeus crying out all the more. He doesn't give up. There's times when we're going to meet opposition in the church. We might even meet people in our parishes who are not living the most Christian life of faith. Don't let that disturb your faith. When you meet resistance, even if when you meet resistance in the church, don't let that be a barrier to your faith. Don't let that destroy your faith. Here are disciples of Jesus. Here are the, here's a multitude following Jesus, and they're telling Bartimaeus, be quiet. But he's not disturbed by that. He doesn't say, I'm not going to follow this guy or run away. He has what you call perseverance. We need to have perseverance if we're going to follow Christ. So I like the fact that he doesn't give up. And he, and he calls out all the more. He's crying out, son of David have mercy on me. He recognizes that the prophecies about a Davidic king ruling forever 
could potentially be fill, fulfilled in Jesus. And he recognizes that above all things, he needs mercy. That's life changing. That's when conversion takes place. So it says that Jesus stopped. And I, I love this, how Jesus hears our cry. He stops. He notes, he takes note of Bartimaeus. There's a beautiful image in the book of Job, if you read the book of Job, where the Lord says to the Hasatan, the Satan, the adversary, he says to him two times, have you noticed my servant Job? And you see something similar here. The crowd doesn't want to listen to Bartimaeus. They want him to, want him to be quiet. But Jesus listens. Jesus stops. We live in a similar world, my brothers and sisters. This world doesn't want to listen to the good news of the gospel. But we should have the same persistence and perseverance that Bartimaeus had, knowing that this is what our Lord wants. He wants the good news of the gospel proclaimed to all nations. And part of the good news is the, is the message that all of us are sinners. All of us need to repent. All of us need conversion. And so Jesus stopped and it says that he said, call him. So notice how our Lord personally is asking for Bartimaeus. He's asking them, call him. And they called the blind man. So Mark is playing on the words here. Notice how he's calling Bartimaeus the blind man, the blind man because he's underlining something about blindness. There's a difference between spiritual blindness and physical blindness. Here's a blind man who can see spiritually, and that's what God wants us to do. He wants, us to, he wants to take away all of our spiritual blindness so that we can give our life completely to him, so that we can say, I give this life to you, Lord. Take over, it's yours, guide me. And so, Look at what they say to him. They say three things to him, which are really beautiful. Take heart, rise, he's calling you. And that's what I say to every one of you today, to every person watching this video, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So there's a lot of symbolism in this reading here. Theologically, do you realize that Jesus is calling you? Do you right, realize that he wants to encourage you and he wants you to get up? and to do his will. And so in verse 50, it says, throwing off his mantle, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. I love looking at the reactions of people because it tells us something about our own life as disciples. We want to run to him. We, we, want, to, we, want, to, we want to get up and make changes immediately. Don't procrastinate. Bartimaeus didn't procrastinate. He threw off his mantle. He sprang up and he came to Jesus. And that's a beautiful image for us because we sometimes procrastinate. I love the image in, in Luke's gospel of Mary going with haste to visit Elizabeth. Isn't that beautiful? And so in verse 51, it says, Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And so notice this. First, he was asking for mercy. And that's, that's the beginning. Jesus noticed. He called him. You know, Bartimaeus ran to him. And now he's asking for a more specific question. What do you need? And so there's something beautiful here. First, we recognize that we need God's mercy. Then we start to work on all the specific things in our life that need change. And sometimes it's a lifetime of work. Each one of us is a work in progress. So now we're going to focus a little more specifically. Notice how it's underlining the blind man, the blind man. What do you want me to do for you? Now it's this a little bit of a, uh, focusing in on what Bartimaeus needs. And the blind man said, Master, let me receive my sight. Notice how he calls Jesus Master. And there's something that changes in our life. You know, it's one thing if we just go to Jesus and we ask for things, okay? All right, a lot of times when our faith is, you know, really not that mature, we're going to Jesus and we're asking for things. It's another thing when we turn to Jesus and we call him Master, Lord, and God.
And so there's a big change that takes place when he becomes our master, our Lord, and our God. Remember those words of Thomas in John's gospel, John chapter 20, verse 28, when Thomas finally encountered the risen Lord and he said, my Lord and my God. And so I, I want to ask you, are, are you just going to Jesus only because you want something? Or are you serving him as a disciple? Do you recognize him as your Lord and your God and your master? So look at what Bartimaeus says. As he comes to Jesus, he says, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus says to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. He's underlining the importance of the gift of faith. And he's telling him, go your way. In other words, you're healed. You're free to do whatever you want now. Now you're free. True freedom, my brothers and sisters, is when we give our lives in service to Jesus. So Bartimaeus is not going to do whatever he wants. The people of Israel, they made the mistake of wanting to go back to Egypt when they were freed from Egypt in the book of Exodus. Many people make the same mistake. They misuse their freedom. They use their freedom and they become, I'm sorry, they misuse their freedom and they become slaves of sin. Jesus wants to free, free us from the slavery of sin and he wants us to give our lives in service to him. So he says, go your way, your faith has made you well. But look at what Bartimaeus does. It says immediately he received his sight. He was healed. But look at what he does. He follows him, Jesus, on the way. And where are they going? Where is the way taking him? It's the way of the cross. He's following Jesus to the cross. And so Mark is really telling you something about being spiritually healed of your blindness. Bartimaeus, the blind man, can see. He recognizes Jesus as the son of David. He recognizes that he needs mercy. He calls Jesus master. And when Jesus says, go your way, he gets behind Jesus and he follows him to Jerusalem and to the foot of the cross. And so there's something here. We do the same thing. We deny ourselves. We pick up our cross and we follow him. We don't follow this world. So let's go to my notes right now. I just want to look a little bit at the concept of spiritual blindness. And I think if you go to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah often uses a theme of spiritual blindness. And this theme is very profound in the book of Isaiah. He's trying to underline how the people of God have a spiritual blindness and they need to repent. And this is very important if you want to understand the first thing that Bartimaeus is asking for. He's asking for mercy. So Isaiah 29, 9 refers to spiritual blindness. And he, he says that um, he's talking about how this could lead to judgment unless there's healing. And so he talks about how the eyes of the blind will be open and that it's a person, the servant of the Lord, who's going to open the eyes of the blind and how the Lord will lead the blind by a new way. OK, and notice that it's Bartimaeus who follows Jesus on the way to the cross. Uh, the blind are exhorted to see. In other words, the blind are exhorted to leave behind their spiritual blindness. In other words, there has to be conversion. There has to be repentance for this to happen. Uh, it's the servant Israel who's described as being blind and also the servant of the Lord who will heal this blindness. The Lord will ransom his people. He will bring forth the blind. Uh, the watchmen, the kings, the priests, the prophets are blind because they're not leading the people correctly. Okay, And so Isaiah preaches against that. Israel is described as placing their hands along the wall like blind people. So you get the idea. Isaiah is speaking of spiritual blindness, which the Lord will take away. They're spiritually blind because they've rebelled. They're not living the faith. 
and the Lord will take away that spiritual blindness. Well, this really adds a lot of background to the story of Bartimaeus. You can really see, if you look at this gospel closely, you read it and you go, wow, the blind man recognizes Jesus as the son of David. He's asking for mercy. He's calling Jesus master, and he's following him on the way to the cross. And this is what happens to me and you as disciples of Jesus. When we repent of our sin, when there's true conversion, our spiritual blindness is taken away. We leave behind the slavery of sin. We pick up our cross. We deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and we follow Jesus. We walk against the current of this world. We walk against the values of this world, and we share the good news of the gospel to the whole world. My brothers and sisters, may we share this message with others so that they can leave behind their spiritual blindness and follow Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.